The Valley of Death is the loneliest, the hottest, and the most deadly and dangerous spot in the United States. It is a pit of horrors, the spot of all that is grim and ghoulish. Such animal and reptile life as infest this pest hole is of ghastly shape, rancorous nature, and diabolically ugly. It breeds only noxious and venomous things. Its dead do not decompose, but are baked, blistered, and embalmed by the scorching heat through countless ages. It is surely the nearest to the little hell upon earth that the whole wicked world can produce. New York World, 1894. Indeed, the hottest temperature ever recorded on the planet was recorded in Death Valley in July of 1913, a scorching 134 degrees Fahrenheit. But Death Valley National Park offers a heavy dose of something else. One of my favorite memories of Death Valley was um, in, actually quite some time ago, but I was on a field trip and um, one of my mentors in Death Valley geology, um, I had two main mentors in Death Valley geology, Lauren Wright and Benny Troxell. They've been working there since the early 1950s. Um, but I was, Benny, Benny Troxell was leading a field trip that I was on. And I was in his car and he took us up to Dante's view. And, it was the first time I'd been to Dante's View, actually, in a couple years. And I hadn't remembered. I think the time before I'd been up to Dante's View, it had been really cold and windy. And when it's that cold and windy, it's hard to really take in the view. So I didn't, hadn't really appreciated it. So my memory of it wasn't that great. And we got up, coming up to Dante's View, you drive up this long grade. And then just as you crest the, the ridge, and basically pull into the parking lot, you can see the view. And as we were doing that, Benny turned around and he said to us in the back, okay, you're allowed to say, oh wow, only once. <laughs> it was the funniest thing. And we got out there and everybody just sort of burst out with, oh wow, because it was such an amazing view. And then Benny goes, ah, you can't say it again. It was just kind of a silly memory, but it, I, I think it, it, it highlights how you're always saying, oh, wow, when you're in Death Valley. There is the, oh, wow, of tiny, delicate crystals found in the salt flats. the old wow of a European-style castle in the middle of an American desert. The old wow of narrow, winding canyons. There is the oh wow of a small mountain spring containing the only living members of an ancient species of fish.
and the oh wow of the immense scale of this largest national park in the lower 48 states. Death Valley strikes me as a park that's a park of extremes. I mean, you've got the lowest point in North America at 282 feet below sea level of bad water. It's the biggest park in terms of sheer acreage. You've got the biggest rise of a mountain to the top of Telescope Peak from bad water. It's over 11,000 feet change. Um, and also it's the hottest and driest place around. I mean, 134 degrees was the high temperature in July 1913. So this is a place that is just so radically different and so radically extreme for most of the rest of the parks in the national park system. I mean, the view from Zavarisky Point as you're coming in from the east side is quite something when you can actually see into the valley and it is just this gnarled wonderland of, uh, I mean, bleakly beautiful is the most apt descriptor I would use. It's, I mean, there's not a shred of plant life hardly anywhere except a few wildflowers poking out of the you know, the canyons, walls, and you've got the oasis down at Furnace Creek, but this is just a gnarled fantasy land of red and yellow and different hues, and then it, you can see it's just this dry sea. The salt is still there like rings in a bathtub. It's, you know, you can see the eons by just looking out from Zabriskie Point, all these different uh, facets and amazing sights. Death Valley is one place you'll want to bring your camera. Marley Miller has written a book on the geology of Death Valley and is a renowned photographer. Oh, I love taking photographs in Death Valley. Um, I think I probably could have finished my research a little more quickly if I didn't have a camera with me because I was always getting distracted with my camera. There's always so much to see. I love taking pictures of geological phenomena and it's everywhere you look in Death Valley. And if the light is a little bit low, and maybe there's some clouds in the sky, you have good lighting conditions, and just about anything you take a picture of is interesting. So there are so many photographic subjects in Death Valley. It's, it's just a blast to go there and, and take pictures. Every place you look from sunrise to sunset is a place to snap a photo. Death Valley is indeed a photographer's paradise. The beauty of Death Valley is the beauty of the desert, one of the great deserts of the world, the Mojave Desert. The desert is a place to go purify yourself. I mean, you get this certain energy and with the heat and the kind of the clean, crisp air, it feels like a place, you know, everybody goes to go and meditate on something. I mean, I love to go to Death Valley and just get away from it all on a hike. It's like that old uh, story. It's somebody going to the desert to kind of figure things out. And Death Valley is the perfect place to do that. The beauty of Death Valley National Park begins on the grandest scale. It is the scale of the valley itself. Snaking north and south, this long valley is bounded by majestic mountains on each side. 
there are, of course, these amazing mountains. I mean, the mountains and the valley floor, there are no foothills, so the mountains come straight out of the valley, and you can, there's the road that goes along the front of the Black Mountains, and you can be driving along, and if you forget to turn on the road, you'll go from valley floor right into the mountain, and it can be only like 100 feet away. So it's, there's no foothills at all. The mountains go straight up. Um, the mountains are very rugged. The rocks themselves provide their own special kind of beauty. The beauty of swirling colors found in the sheer rock faces of the mountains. The Death Valley is also known for the extraordinary colors of the many badlands along its eastern edge. The most famous of these badlands, known as Artist's Palette, is a sacred place for aficionados of the Star Wars saga. I was a big Star Wars fan as a kid, so it's fun to go to Death Valley with that in mind, because it would, uh, they filmed several of the scenes in the original Star Wars movie in Death Valley. So I like to go up to Artist's Palette, which is a one-way drive in the park, not too far from Furnace Creek. and. Uh, and it's this beautifully hued mountainside. You know, there's purples and greens and blues. But it tucked in there where it was where R2-D2 ran away on the planet Tatooine. So you get a little bit of this geological, uh, you know, just anomaly along with a little bit of Hollywood history. Much has been written and said about the beauty and value of desert sunsets for the soul. When I admire the wonder of a sunset, my soul expands in worship of the Creator, Mahatma Gandhi. What is life? It is the flash of a firefly in the night. It is the breath of a buffalo in the wintertime. It is the little shadow which runs across the land and loses itself in the sunset. Blackfoot warrior. And as Mark Twain said, Happiness is a desert sunset. It is there for all, but most of us look the other way and lose it. The beauty of the Death Valley sunset lasts forever in your soul. Not every desert has sand dunes. In fact, most don't. One of the wonders of Death Valley is that it has five dune fields. These ever-shifting landforms present some of the most stunning geometrical shapes on the planet. Then there is a beauty found nowhere else on the planet. The beauty of the salt flats. I would describe the uh, salt beds in Death Valley as otherworldly. You know, it's such a different landscape than anything else in the West. And uh, you have to see it to believe it. The best place in the park to experience the beauty and the scale of the salt flats is Badwater Basin right in the heart of the valley. Badwater Basin, I mean the low point of the low point in Death Valley, I mean it's just this caked salty basin that just, there's nothing else like it that I've ever seen, it, you know, it's just a dry sea and uh, you sit there and you look at the dry seabed and then you turn around and look at the mountain and 282 feet up the wall they have a sign for sea level. And it's kind of interesting that you're sitting there so far below sea level at the bottom of what was once this great vast sea in the California desert. The grandeur and enormous scale of the salt flats is indeed something to behold. But there is another way to experience this alluring landscape. If I were to get down on my hands and knees on the salt pan, I would see a lot of cracks in the salt. 
and growing in the cracks would be little fibers of salt. And uh, they're very fragile. A lot of times, if you're in an area where people walk out onto the salt a lot, you won't see them because they break easily. Um, some places, if you're out far on the salt pan or if it's soon after it had rained a lot, you can find little pools of water and you can find salt crystallizing in little pools sometimes. I've seen salt crystallizing in old footprints. Um, so you, you get a whole range of actually shapes to the crystallizing salt. If you find it in, in a body of water crystallizing, you're likely to find it in its typical cubic shape that, that salt typically forms. But a lot of times you just see those little fibers. Like many features in the park, the extreme heat has conjured up references to the devil and his infernal fire. One such place just north of Badwater Basin is called Devil's Golf Course. It was said only the devil could play golf on this surface. With an elevation several feet above the valley floor of the Badwater Salt Flats, Devil's Golf Course remains dry during flooding allowing the weathering processes to sculpt the salt here into spectacular and complicated shapes, including these rare cup-like structures. Remarkably, the salt and gravel beds of Devil's Golf Course extend to a depth of more than 1,000 feet. On the north side of Death Valley, it's a volcanic crater that's this orange and red pockmark on the landscape, it looks like it's melting into the earth. It's, it's a very different, you don't see much volcanism in the park in Death Valley, but this is the one spot where you can see a volcanic event that happened in the relatively recent geological past. And you can hike down into the depths of the crater. It's, it's a steep but short climb, or you can hike around it. You'll get all these incredible views of this multi-hued orange and red and white crater that just stands out as one of the most otherworldly sites in this very otherworldly place. All of these extraordinary features of Death Valley National Park are here because of its geology. And it is because of the park's geology that it has been set aside as a national treasure. Flying over western Utah and across Nevada into southeast California is one of North America's largest geographic regions, the Great Basin, with its basin and range topology. Below we can see the pattern that makes up that topology. Running north and south is a large sequence of mountain ranges separated by valleys. The Great Basin, uh, uh, tectonically uh chopped up area, if you will, in the western United States that extends from the Rocky Mountains westward to the Sierra Nevadas in California represent a typical example, I think, of what um, in this country we think of as a physiographic region. Physiographic regions meaning regions that combine physical uh, surface topography characteristics with biogeographic uh, characteristics and uh, and to a certain degree climatological characteristics, but basically they are defined by their underlying geologic structures. Dutton argued that the Great Basin looked like an army of caterpillars marching northward out of Mexico. Uh, and in fact on the old maps that's really what they look like. Um, these generally aligned mountain ranges, the product of uh, tectonic forces at the edge of the Craton, North American Craton, uh, represent a unique uh, terrain type for Americans at any rate. The Great Basin is a physiographic region punctuated by shallow lakes and large sand deposits. There are rivers, but they don't flow to the sea. On the ground, the Great Basin looks like this. Low-lying Rocky Mountain Ranges. 
On this map, you can see the vastness of the Great Basin. Human habitation is minimal, with the only substantial metropolitan areas, Reno, Las Vegas, and Salt Lake City, all located along its boundaries. And here is Death Valley. How this region, including Death Valley National Park, came to be as it is, is based on the study of geomorphology. It is a way of mapping of landforms to try to say these areas are similar, behave similarly. So if, for example, you might have a region such as the Basin and Range in the Western United States, and the idea being that you would call that a region, a geomorphic region or a physiographic province, in order to say the processes within that region are similar and it's a useful way of describing landscape processes. You're able to take a region and say, this region is dominated by faulting, normal faulting, and uh, dry desert processes, and therefore we would expect it to produce a certain set of landforms and certain set of physical geographic landscapes. Landscapes derived from intense mountain building processes. So there's this big compressional mountain building event in the Mesozoic. Um, <clears throat> and today it's an active place for mountain building. The, the crust is extending and so you get these big faults called normal faults. And that's why the mountains are rising today and we see all sorts of features along the front of the range that indicate that it's very active. The floor of Death Valley is dropping relative to the mountains. So the mountains are going up, the floor is going down, and that's because there's a big fault zone between them that causes the mountains to rise and, and the floor to drop. And that fault zone is um, potentially an active fault. There's all the indications along the valley that um, it will slip again. And um, it's a product of crustal extension. So the region of Death Valley is basically being pulled apart and that causes things to break, which makes the faults. And so then the movement along the faults causes that change in elevation. This pulling apart of the crust is true not only for Death Valley, but the whole basin and range region. But what about those volcanoes on the north side of the park? Partly because of Death Valley's crustal extension, when, when the crust extends, it, it tends to make it easier for magma to make its way to the surface. And that magma then, if it makes it to the surface, becomes lava, which is volcanic. And there's a lot of volcanic features in Death Valley. Um, there are some very recent ones. There's a series of volcanic explosion craters at the north end of the park called the Ubihibi craters. And the latest information I have on that is that they might be as young as about 300 years old. Um, and they formed because magma was moving up towards the Earth's surface and, and interacted with groundwater, which caused a big explosion, hence the, the craters. The spectacular badlands found in Death Valley are also a product of the valley's widening and sinking. This movement, combined with the uplift of the Black Mountains to the east, tilted the old valley floor, a tilting that is clearly visible in the Badlands. This tilting provided the necessary relief that set up the differential erosion patterns that produced the Badlands we see today. However, there are a number of prominent geologic features that are not a product of mountain building. Sand dunes are one. Death Valley's got a number of dune fields. I think there's five within the national park, but they're relatively small compared to the whole park. And so they form only in specific places. And just in general, for sand dunes to form, you need a source for all the sand you need wind to move the sand, but you also need there to be a place that the wind kind of dies out a little bit, so it drops the sand. And so those really only occur in a few places, um, and that's one reason why sand doesn't just cover the whole place. 
And if you look at the locations of these sand dunes in Death Valley, they tend to be in not quite nooks and crannies in the mountain fronts, but when you look at a map, you can see that there might be an embayment in the mountain front, and that's where the sand dune field would be typically. So they're always in a slightly more protected area than the rest of the valley. Other prominent geological features in the valley, not caused by mountain building, are the large alluvial fans that seem to pour out of each side of the valley from the mountains above. From the air, these erosional features clearly resemble handheld fans. They result from the natural erosion and breakup of the mountains. Erosional material falls into the numerous mountain valleys, and during extreme flood events, the water is so powerful, it pushes sediment and rocks out of the canyons into the valley below. Out on the plains, the material spreads out into the characteristic fan shape. Interestingly, on the east side of the valley, there are numerous smaller alluvial fans. Whereas on the west side, the erosional material is formed into a few very large alluvial fans. Walk out onto an alluvial fan and you'll be walking on what's called desert pavement. You can see something called desert pavement on um, a lot of the alluvial fans where it's just like a pavement, uh, where there are a lot of small interlocking pebbles and sometimes larger rocks with finer and finer rocks kind of in between. And um, these tend to form because the, the wind will blow the finer material out and through time those rocks kind of rearrange themselves and form this kind of interlocking, very smooth, hard surface that's just like a pavement. Of course, the geological feature Death Valley is best known for is its massive salt flats. The salt flats in Death Valley are, um, there's hundreds if not thousands of feet of interbedded salt and gravel and mud in, out in the salt pan. Most of the salt pan today is covered in salt. And the salt there is, is there because um, water, which will carry various salts, will evaporate when it gets to the floor of Death Valley. So Death Valley, the floor itself, is the terminus of a river called the Amargosa River, which sources on the other side of the Funeral Mountains in the Amargosa Valley, and it flows south for some, quite some distance, and then turns around and <clears throat> heads north. So it can carry water when it's flowing, so during the rainy season, that water carries salt. When it rains in Death Valley, water will come down off the alluvial fans and empty out into the salt pan. And all that water is carrying salt with it. And when the water evaporates, which it always does, because those summers are long and hot, the salt will precipitate out of the water. Death Valley also used to be filled by a lake some 10,000 years ago called Lake Manly. And um, so during the end of the ice ages, there was a lot more water. And so there was a, a lake that was at times up to 600 feet deep that filled Death Valley. All that water is evaporated. And so it's left behind a lot of salt. Salt, which is a major factor in creating one of the unique ecosystems in Death Valley. Death Valley is part of the Mojave Desert, a cold winter desert defined geographically by the presence of a plant species, the Joshua tree. Growing up to 40 feet in height, Joshua trees are neither trees nor cacti, but a member of the yucca family. Spectacular stands of Joshua trees can be found here and there throughout Death Valley National Park. 
The Mojave exhibits the most extreme temperature range throughout the year of any place in the nation. Summer weather is dominated by heat. Temperatures on valley floors can soar above 120 degrees Fahrenheit and above 130 degrees Fahrenheit in Death Valley, which at 282 feet below sea level is the lowest place in North America and often the hottest place in the country. Winter temperatures can drop below 20 degrees Fahrenheit. The part of the Mojave Desert overlapping the basin and range creates xeric conditions with only a few plants well adapted to this hot, dry environment. In addition, most of the valleys are internally drained, so all precipitation that falls within a valley, such as Death Valley, does not flow to the ocean. The result are those dry salt lake beds. Lake beds that only a handful of plants can survive. Plants that include the desert holly with its silver-colored leaves, pickleweed, a succulent that stores absorbed salt within special cells in its stems, and three species of mesquite trees, which are actually members of the legume family. Not surprisingly, most animals of the desert are nocturnal. You won't see them in person, but you know they're there by the numerous tracks decorating the sand dunes and the muddy edges of the deserts. As in all desert lore, the Mojave and Death Valley have oases. Spring-fed collections of water that are unique ecosystems unto themselves. One of the best-known oases, located just outside the park, is China Ranch Date Farm. Imagine towering cottonwoods and willows by a wandering stream. Spectacular date palms. And abundant wildlife, all hidden away in some of the most dramatic scenery the desert has to offer. And right in the heart of the park itself is Furnace Creek Ranch. Originally built as a working ranch in the 1880s, and later the home of the famous 20 Mule Team Borax mining operation, the ranch at Furnace Creek today offers a complete resort complex for visitors to the park. It includes restaurants, a golf course, a nearby airport, and a park visitor center. It is also one of the best places to see bird life. Bird life such as the most visible bird in the park, the mysterious jet black ravens. If one is lucky, you get a glimpse of flocks of starlings and blackbirds. The noisy great-tailed grackle, and morning doves. But the most fascinating ecosystems in the park are the undeveloped springs. Springs that are the same today as they were thousands of years ago. One such place in the park is along Salt Creek. There is an easy half-mile loop trail which leads you along a boardwalk over a small stream. This is a good location for viewing insects such as butterflies, damselflies, and the exotic pupfish. The Death Valley pupfish are the last known survivors of what is thought to have been a large ecosystem of fish species that lived in Lake Manly a glacial lake which dried up at the end of the last ice age. The desert pup fish is a small, silvery-colored fish with dark bands on its sides that grows to be about 2.5 inches in length. Feeding on algae, 
pupfish can survive in desert springs heated to 113 degrees and can tolerate water twice as salty as the ocean. One of the most unusual pieces of Death Valley National Park is found outside of the park boundaries. Devil's Hole preserves the smallest member of the pupfish family. Needless to say, these desert oases have played a critical role in the human history of the region and the park. Death Valley, being one of the most inhospitable places in the country, it is amazing that anyone lives here at all. However, evidence shows that after the last ice age, 10,000 years ago, when the climate was less severe, Paleolithic and later archaic Indians occupied the region. Then around 500 AD, it became the ancestral home of the Shoshone and Paiute people. People who lived here in a few isolated villages scattered throughout the present day park. It is believed that the first white people to see Death Valley were a group of 49ers in search of a shortcut to California's gold fields on the western edge of the Sierra Mountains. Winding their way through the valley, they barely escaped with their lives. However, one of these pioneers picked up a piece of silver, and it wasn't long before an intense search for riches was underway. Within the park itself, there is nothing but the mythical lost mother load of gold. But on either side of the valley, the story was different. Boomtown sprang up. One was Rhyolite, today a ghost town. The ghost town of Rhyolite is near Beatty, Nevada, on the east side of the park. It's the eastern gateway. And uh, it was a gold rush town in the early 1900s. It's said to have about 3,000 to 5,000 people in 1907, kind of the peak of the boom there. But then some economic problems followed, and there was a financial panic. And pretty soon, by 1920, nobody lived there. And it's a fascinating ghost town these days. The depot and a lot of the old downtown structures are still intact, although very little of the uh, homes where people lived are still there. But there's also this incredible public art museum called the Goldwell Open Air Museum that for fans of unique and quirky and avant-garde public art, it's a must stop. Uh, uh, there's a uh, interpretation of the Last Supper made with these ghostly frozen fabrics so that uh, somebody had probably climbed into them and sculpted them and so it looks like this invisible humans in them in each of them and then there's a whole last supper of them alongside each other there's also a, you know a couple other quirky pieces there and it's really a, it was one of my favorite memories is stopping a rile life with my father a few years ago a few of the other pieces in the open air art museum are Sit Here, Ghost Rider, and Lady Desert, the Venus of Nevada. All that survives today of this once bustling boom town is the Cookbank Building, the Rhyolite Mercantile General Store, and the once glorious train station. The most intact gold mining town in the region is Bodie, sandwiched between Death Valley and the Sierra Mountains to the west. Bodie was in its heyday in the late 1800s. What's left today stands in a state of arrested decay and is maintained by the California State Parks system. However, in Death Valley, Although many searched, and many more claimed, there was a mother load. No gold of significance was ever found. 
Instead, what was found was called white gold, borax. The 20 mule team rigs that moved ore from the mines to the rail junction have become an iconic image of the Old West. The discovery of borax north of the mouth of Furnace Creek was made in 1881. A year later, the Harmony Borax Works began mining operations and a small settlement of adobe and stone buildings, plus a refinery sprang up along the spring. This remarkable oasis created by the abundant water supply of the Travertine Springs became a haven for miners. Alfalfa fields that supported the mules and horses in a date ranch. By the end of the 1920s, mining operations in Death Valley were abandoned. And the Borax Company decided to install tourist housing at the old ranch. Today, in addition to being the hub of social activities in the park, Furnace Creek Ranch contains a remarkable open-air museum commemorating the mining history of the area. Open to the public in 1954, its highlights include a 20-mule team borax cart, as well as its eventual replacement, a steam-powered locomotive. Other attractions include the oldest structure in Death Valley, built around 1883, an old stagecoach, and many remnants of both the mining and milling operations that once dominated the landscape in Death Valley. As the mining operations were winding down, a new piece of Death Valley history was just beginning, Scotty's Castle. It's in the north side of the park and it's, kind of, it's in one of these few rare green oases of the park and it's an architectural masterwork. It's very unique, kind of one of these must-do things on the north side of the park. And, and the tour guide is in, uh, they do it in period dress and everything, and they're, they're characters, you know, they're like actors. And so it's quite, a, I mean, it's quite a place. It's, it's an architecturally unique place, and it's got this unique history of this kind of con man that befriended the tycoon, but the tycoon liked hanging out with the con man so much he didn't mind being conned by him. And you get all that from on this fascinating tour. Our tour guide was interpretive park ranger Eric Nachmus. My name is Eric and I'll be your guide here for the next 50 to 60 minutes or so as we head through the house. So almost everything in the house is original, so I ask you not to touch anything or lean on any of the furniture, which is real easy to do. And the one I always catch myself doing almost is leaning on the walls. See when we're outside uh, here at the back porch, try to lean against the walls um, and try to please each other too. Now you can take photos as much as you like. There's no restrictions. You can use the flash and everything. We went through the main gate into the castle courtyard. Inside here, if you look over the main door, it doesn't say Scotty's Castle. It says Death Valley Ranch. And so Death Valley Ranch was the original name, the, I guess official name, that Albert and Bessie Johnson called this place. They were the ones that actually purchased the land, uh, built the house, and used it as their vacation home. So they were millionaires from Chicago, making about a million dollars a year, and um, they could build a vacation home anywhere they wanted. Uh, basically, they're going to build it you know, from scratch to their, all their custom specifications. And uh, Death Valley is a place that is famous for being inhospitable, you know, a desert wilderness, the driest and hottest place around. Uh, the year they started construction, not a single drop of rain fell, 0, 0.00 inches of precipitation. And the average is only two inches uh, a year of rain. So if you are in their position, you have millions of dollars to build a custom vacation home, your dream home, anywhere you wanted to. You think this is the place you would choose? <laughs> A lot of obvious reasons why you would not want to choose uh, Death Valley, but there were a lot of unique opportunities uh, they found out here that kept them coming back again and again. And uh, we'll talk all about the opportunities that they found, as well as how their Death Valley Ranch came to be uh, so well known as Scotty's Castle. Scotty was basically their friend and partner. And we'll talk all about how they uh, got to know each other and 
how this place got built as a result of that partnership as we start touring through the house. So if you follow me, we'll head right through the main door here. Inside is the spectacularly furnished living room with its custom-made fireplace. Opposite the fireplace is an indoor waterfall that acted as an air conditioner. Even on the hottest summer days, the room never got above 93 degrees. Here are the famous chairs and couches where Walter Scott, also known as Scotty, would sit and entertain the Johnson's guests with tall tales of the Wild West. Tales of how he was part of Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West show. His legendary train ride. Harrowing tales of prospecting Death Valley. And the biggest tale of all, the fabulous gold mining below the castle itself. This unique relationship between Scotty, the self-promoter par excellence, and Albert Johnson, the Chicago millionaire, came about because it was one of mutual convenience and even admiration. Well, Scotty was this shyster who kind of talked a big game about a hundred years ago in, a, in the early days of Death Valley, after the mining boom. And he, he always claimed that he had a big, uh, rich mine strike and he, you know, everybody knew him. And he befriended this industrialist um, from Chicago who had came out there to, for the, uh, the fresh air for, for, uh, for health reasons, actually. And although he kind of knew that Scotty was a bit of a fraud, he financed him. And they built this castle together. I mean, it was Johnson's place to live, but Scotty, when Johnson wasn't around, would tell everybody that it was his place. So it, it got the name Scotty's Castle. We continued the castle tour inside the solarium. And you see this little keyboard here, this uh, 25 keys correspond to the 25 chimes in the clock tower behind us here. So you can even play the chime tower inside the house. Now up over the fireplace we have Albert and uh, Scotty. And you'll see, um, I forgot to point out, we're gathering up, you might have seen the JS on the grill there. And um, on all those property posts, there's JS stamped on there. And you'll see it a few little places around the house also. So Johnson and Scott. And uh, you know, Johnson and Scotty came from very different backgrounds, and it's, it's kind of funny, almost illustrated in the photos here. People like to joke about uh, Scotty's picture looks like a mugshot. <laughs> you know, it's a profile shot. I don't know how many of you have a photo of your profile uh, in your house. <laughs> so uh, Albert was born into a wealthy Ohio family, attended Cornell University, and um, got his degree in engineering. Of course, like every medieval castle, this one, too, had a lavish dining area. When the Johnsons would have guests for dinner, sometimes Scotty would sit in this chair over here, sort of, again, hold court, and he sat beneath, right, uh, right beneath this inscription. It says, Ake Dicha, translates into, oh, what joy, or oh, what happiness. And that was Scotty's role here. He'd fill this room, this house, with joy and happiness by telling his tales of adventure and his uh, you know, experiences out here in the West. Now, one thing he might have uh, teased Albert about was uh, these bookshelves. Uh, Albert wanted this to be his personal library. It's had these shelves designed for uh, his books. But Bessie wanted um, this to be the formal dining room. So you can see who uh, won that argument. So Albert doesn't get his library here, but you can imagine Scotty teasing him about it, you know, telling guests, uh, make sure you ask Albert to give you the tour of the library later, and things like that. But Albert did get something more um, important to him here, uh, the opportunity to build this house, to take on the challenge of um, not just the construction of the house itself, but providing those modern conveniences, uh, like electricity, uh, most of all. And the best example of how he's able to sort of engage his mind as an engineer to do so is by some of the things that they have over here in the kitchen. This place was designed with electricity, but every um, light fixture, almost every light fixture you see, is kind of made it look like it was originally uh, for holding candles. Um, so that was one thing that the Johnsons wanted to do here was to make it look like this was, uh, you know, from an earlier era, hundreds of year old uh, building. And so the light fixtures are one example. 
The uh, refrigerator here, the electric ice box, is another one in which they could have uh, closed this redwood cabinet to kind of hide it away. The uh, range over here is in the fireplace, which was, of course, never a fireplace, but just designed to put the stove there. And the corner over here, you can't quite see if you're over there, but you see as you walk by um, on the way out, there's a, it's supposed to look like a well. There's pulley at the top and then a barrel at the bottom. And if you were to flip up that lid, you wouldn't find uh, fresh water down there. You'd find garbage. So that was just a place to hide the garbage can. <laughs> and so uh, Albert and uh, Scotty found uh, a lot of unique opportunities here. You know, Albert to try to take on the challenge of building this place with all the modern conveniences that you'd have in the city. After viewing the master bedrooms, Albert and Bessie each had their own. We walked across a gallery and peered into the guest rooms. The tour ends in the Johnson's Entertainment Center. Uh, has anybody watched any of those TV shows where celebrities show off their houses and you know, they go through with the cameraman? Yeah. Well, if you watch these shows, you know, uh, I've noticed they always got to have a uh, personal movie theater now is the thing that you have to have. So the Johnson's actually intended to also have a personal movie theater in this room right here. Uh, the idea was there had been a screen um, set up here, and then they had this uh, theater organ that would accompany the uh, silent pictures, um, you know, of the day. I guess they never quite finished the uh, screen because, uh, you know, talking movies had basically uh, taken over the silent films. But they did have the organ, and, um, you know, that was a, a pretty... Um, expensive thing to have, uh, to say the least, and uh, probably the most impressive uh, feature of the house. So you could play the organ from over there, of course, and there was a concert every year in June, um, the 21st and 22nd for this uh, coming year, 2013, you get a chance to come back. It's uh, something not to be missed. Uh, you can also take these rolls of music and just load it up into the uh, automatic player here. And today we've got it all rigged up, we don't need to load it up and do that works with just a simple press of a button, and we'll start playing uh, uh, tracks that are basically loaded up on the The eccentric millionaire Albert Johnson passed away on January 7th, 1948. His beautiful wife, Bessie, preceded him by five years. The incomparable sphinx of the desert, Walter Scott, died in 1954. In 1970, the National Park Service purchased Scotty's castle for $850,000. It has become one of the must-see experiences in Death Valley National Park. Death Valley National Park, located mostly in California and a bit of Nevada, can be accessed both from the east and west. In 1933, President Herbert Hoover designated 3,000 square miles as Death Valley National Monument. Then in 1994, President Clinton added an additional 1.3 million acres and granted the valley national park status, making it the largest park in America outside of Alaska. The park itself is 140 miles long. From its highest peak at 11,000 feet to its lowest point at the Badwater Basin, the distance is twice the depth of the Grand Canyon. These salt flats on the floor of Death Valley cover more than 200 square miles and is 40 miles long and five miles wide. Not only is Badwater Basin the lowest point in the park, it is also the lowest point in the Western Hemisphere and the place where that record hottest temperature was recorded. Annually, over one million visitors are drawn to the park. Most come to drive over the park's network of roads and make short forays to snap pictures at overlooks. 
or make gentle hikes into the dramatic canyons along the park's east side. One such hike takes visitors to the spectacular Natural Bridge. Natural Bridge Canyon is one of the few canyons with an official trailhead. The cool hike contains a natural stone bridge, accessible after a 15-minute walk from the parking area. Framed by the narrow canyon walls, the hike back provides spectacular views of the valley floor. Eric Peterson has written a definitive guide to hiking Death Valley. He knows it can be a dangerous place for the novice hiker. When you're hiking Death Valley, do bring a lot of water. Bring twice as much water than you, than you think you're going to drink. Uh, a gallon a day is a good benchmark. Also, do get up early. You, it'll be much cooler if you hike when the sun rises as opposed to having a leisurely breakfast and getting out there at 9 o'clock. It'll be 100 degrees before you know it. Uh, don't hike by yourself if you can avoid it. It's a good rule of thumb anywhere, but especially in Death Valley. And uh, don't wander too far off the trail. A lot of the, they don't even call a lot of the hiking routes in Death Valley trails because they aren't trails. They're not maintained. They're in washes and canyons. And so once you start venturing too far off the trail, it's very hard to locate or you know, the non-trail once again. So it's highly recommended to have a map and have a clear idea of your route before you embark on that journey. A favorite trail for both the geologist and the hiker is Titus Canyon. When I go to Death Valley, I like to rise with the sun. You got to get up and beat the sun to hike. I mean, and so I, I, my favorites are going into some of the canyons, Sunrise Canyon and Titus Canyon, just as the sun gets up. And go on a nice loop hike and get that beautiful golden hour of sun for some photography and catch those colors, those reds and yellows and oranges and just their, their very stark uh, beauty. You can see evidence for ancient mountain building events during the Mesozoic. There's one place, um, there's a, a road called Titus Canyon. You can drive down this gravel road down this amazing canyon. And there's the narrows at the bottom where the walls go up over 100 feet and there's barely room for your car. Um, those rocks are, they look like they're flat lying. And a, normally a flat lying rock is one that hasn't been deformed much because sedimentary rocks are deposited flat. And so you see flat lying rocks and you think not much has happened, but these have been completely overturned. And they've been completely overturned because there's a big fold. A must experience is a 20 mule team canyon loop road. 20 Mule Team Canyon is an unpaved 2.7 mile one-way driving trail just off Highway 190, just south of Furnace Creek. Although the name of the canyon conjures up images of the famous 20 Mule Team wagons, originally introduced by William Tell Coleman to transport borax ore to the Harmony Borax Works, this trail was not actually part of the original 165-mile 20-mule team borax freight route. 20-mule team canyon on the back side of the Black Mountains is very accessible and it's this amazing eroded primeval landscape that's been eroded into old lake bed deposits and um, you can park your car and hike up any of the canyons there. Some of the canyons actually lead to the crest of the Black Mountains. They filmed part of Star Wars, apparently, at, at 20 Mule Team Canyon. The most talked about place in Death Valley is the mysterious racetrack playa, a place known for its strange moving rocks. The dicey 26-mile road to the dry lake bed begins near Ubihibi Crater. The narrow, bumpy road winds through the canyon situated between the Cottonwood and Last Chance Ranges. Along the way, we encounter what we had hoped to find during our trip to Death Valley, a piece of typical Mojave Desert with its signature Joshua tree forest. At last, we find the abundance of the cacti that the desert is known for. Barrow cactus, 
choya cactus, and the ubiquitous prickly pear cactus. After traveling the 26 miles, we reached the stunning white lake bed and the amazing monolithic island outcrop of quartz monzonite called the Grand Stand. Scattered around are the famous sailing black rocks that are said to move mysteriously across the dry lake bed on their own. It is a haunting and beautiful sight. The racetrack is the playa. It's a dry lake bed deep in uh, deep down dirt roads that are just four by four roads uh, in the north part of Death Valley. And there's these rocks there that they they leave trails, large boulders, 100 pounds plus that leave trails. So they've obviously been moving around this racetrack. But the thing is, nobody's ever seen them move. The theory is is that when it gets cold enough that they have a little bit of moisture on the bottom and it freezes in the shadows of the rock itself and the winds blow these boulders around the racetrack. And, uh, but nobody's ever seen it. They just see these trails and it's, uh, there's some amazing imagery. It's just uh, one of those things that is completely unique. I've never heard of anything like that. We walk around the dry lake bed looking for tracks, evidence of the rocks having moved. This is not a salt lake bed like Badwater Basin. It is some sort of fine clay-like material, though the cracks are very impressive. Finally, we stumble upon a rock and the connected trail, but we're not convinced. It looks man-made, a forgery. Then, there they are. Two rocks with curving trails of at least 10 yards. Old trails, but trails nonetheless. It is said the rocks only move every three to four years, and the trails don't last much longer. Here's another. Perhaps someday somebody will see them move. There is one last way to see the valley, by plane. But first, using a satellite image map, Dr. Miller gives us an overview of the valley. So this satellite image of Death Valley um, shows a big part of the park, but certainly not the whole park. The park extends south of here and north of here, but it shows basically central Death Valley. So here are the Black Mountains right here. This is the salt pan. This is the area of um, Badwater Basin, which is the lowest spot at almost 300 feet below sea level is right here and the Panamint Mountains, mountains, which rise up to 11,000 feet at Telescope Peak, right about here, um, as this range on the west. The um, fault zone that runs along the side of the Black Mountains is, you can pick it out, it's right here where the mountains end and the valley begins. And it's a little bit irregular and then it continues down here. There's another uh, big, what's called a strike-slip fault um, that's runs through here called the Northern Death Valley Furnace Creek Fault Zone. And then there's another strike slip fault that's down here that's called the Southern Death Valley Fault Zone. The alluvial fans, the small ones you can see along the um, Black Mountains right here, and then the really large Bajada on the west side of the valley you can see here. You can see some springs coming out at the bottom of the Bajada along the base. Our plane takes off from the deserted, unmanned airport at Furnace Creek. Here, the altimeter starts out below zero, below sea level. We climb up and start heading north through the valley. Looking on either side, we see the dramatic rise of the Panamint Range on the west and the Amargosa Range on the east. Below is one of the valley's many expansive salt flats. As the plane follows State Route 190, we come across the stunning mesquite flat sand dunes. Next is a desert oasis village of stovepipe wells. The stretch of valley heading north from stovepipe wells 
is a remarkable example of the park's alluvial fans. To the west are Panamint's giant fans. And to the east are Amargosa's numerous but much smaller fans. We are now at the northeastern edge of the park. A large section of Badlands flanks the road to Scotty's Castle. And there it is. Tucked away like a forgotten secret is the Death Valley Ranch, otherwise known as Scotty's Castle. The bright red color of the Spanish tiled rooftops is clearly visible. The plane begins to head west on its way to perhaps the most spectacular sight in Death Valley to view by air. The enormous Yubi Hebe Crater and its younger cousin, Little Hebe. Rarely viewed from the air, these relatively young craters are truly awe-inspiring. The plane flies back south and we revisit the numerous alluvial fans as well as the white sands of the mesquite flat sand dunes. We pass the lush greenery of the Furnace Creek Ranch. Continuing south on the east side of the valley are the colorful badlands of Artist's Palette. Next, we see the seemingly flat plain of Devil's Golf Course, which, as we saw viewed from the ground, reviews an area of rugged, rocky salt deposits. Then on to the seemingly endless white of Badwater Basin. We make one last circle and turn back north to the airport. Here are a few last snaps from our journey over this amazing photographer's paradise.